You're listening to Creep Peaks Podcast. So it begins again. Welcome again to the Creep Geeks Podcast. I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And we got a lot of stuff to talk about. All right. So anyway, here we go. This particular podcast episode is episode number 201. December's Paranormal, Contest Winner Exposed, and Mysterious Monolith Sightings. Yeah. All right. So anyway, uh, last podcast we did was episode number 200, hence yeah. the 201, and we had a contest. Sure did. <laughs> Yay, it was just as enthusiastic. Well, out of our myriad of listeners, tens of listeners, we had three people submit answers to win some contest, contest, contest swag. Yeah. From well, us. We never posted what they'd win, so I'm just surprised. Well, no, that upped it up to us to uh, well, I said make that it we as good or post you know. what we were, what they were going to win, and I never did. Oh. Yeah. Because it's, it's been a busy couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And by a couple of weeks, I mean like five days since the last time we did a podcast. Ish. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. So anyway, moving back into the podcast, check this out. If you want to give us a call, we have a phone number for you. And this phone number is where you could share an experience or if you have a question for us or if you'd like us to uh, talk about something on the podcast, you can certainly do that. It's a toll-free number and it's a Roswell area code. And that phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yeah. It's a voicemail. So just leave a voicemail. And don't leave a voicemail that says, hey, call me back. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it's no. prob- probably not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. We've had it happen to us. Anyway. Okay. So let's talk about the podcast contest. Yeah. And the question kind of went like this. Let me find the question. Do you remember what the question was? How will Greg capture a brown mountain light? Yeah. Or one of the brown mountain lights. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't know, we've been looking into the Brown Mountain lights for a while, and every so often we go up there and try to see them. Yeah. And we have. We've seen them a couple different times, and we talk different ways about maybe having a better or more involved interaction with just, you know, going beyond just seeing a Brown Mountain light. Mm-hmm. And it turned into what? What? How? You know? How would you do that sort of thing? And just joking around, I came up with a, a way to capture a Brown Mountain light. This also works for things like raccoons. <laughs> Squirrels, possums, you know, just it's it's a it's a proven method. And I said I would capture a brown mountain light, and this is the answer to the question for the swag, with a hot dog on a stick. Yes. And my reasoning was, if you're up there and we're at like say Wiseman's View or the Overlook, and one of these brown mountain lights goes whizzing by, and it's a possibility it might be a plasma ball or something like that. If I stuck out a hot dog on a stick and it ran into it, because maybe it wanted a delicious frankfurter <laughs> or a hot dog, maybe it's a little hungry or something like that, you know, we could capture it somehow. Maybe throw a coat over it or whatever, or, or pull the stick back in to get it over land and, you know, kind of figure it out from there. Because honestly, we didn't figure out part B of the capturing plan would be what to do after we have it captured by it attached to the hot dog on a stick. Well, because there, there are the theories, and you've even surmised some of these, that the brown mountain lights might be some sort of living organism yeah and we've mentioned the hot dog on the stick method several times throughout uh our research and our discussions about the brown mountain lights yeah and we even have like an interview we did with a local experiencer yeah uh, on one of our youtube channels so we've talked about this numerous times throughout the past 200 episodes yeah yeah. So we technically had more than one response to our podcast uh, podcast contest question. Yeah. And the the uh, first response was from uh, one of our listeners, James M., mm-hmm. otherwise known as Treason X. Um, he said, basically, I would use a hot dog. Which, if you think about it, if you just fling a hot dog at a brown mountain light, I mean, if it's plasma, it'll cook the hot dog. Maybe, or explode it or something like that. And it'll just fall back to the ground. But you still haven't caught the brown mountain light. Yeah. So just flinging a hot dog at one wouldn't work. That's right. (laughs) However. So it was correct, but not 100% correct. Yeah. So the next response was from Bobby, Bobby B, and he got it 100%. He said hot dog on a stick. (laughs) 
So now, in all fairness, we do know Bobby, and we have talked about this with him in great and agonizing detail. So in the in the uh, instance of fairness, he wins a little something too. Yeah. Um. Now this response we we got via email, and I thought was pretty interesting and kind of thorough. Yes, because they sent a legitimate answer, yes. sincere and like, answer. <laughs> and so, you know, with the effort involved there and the plan that's included in the email, which I'll read you in just one second, he also wins a little something. So there you go. Everybody won. Uh, but the answer to the Bryson sentence is, here's my answer on how Greg will capture the Brown Mountain Lights. First, he will have a person at Wiseman's View watching the mountain while he is on a four-wheeler or dirt bike near Brown Mountain. Uh, God, that's cool. I'm getting right. <laughs> this is then he will ask the permission or he asks the person next. To, I can't even read. Then he will ask the person to text him when the lights are seen. Right. Mm -hmm. Then that person will tell him the approximate location and he will bushwhack or drive his way to the location only to see that it has disappeared. <laughs> yes. And, the, and that's the part where I'm like, that's about 100% <laughs> correct. You know, it's something because this is what happens, right? People are like, there it is. And you go after it and it's just gone. What happened? It's yeah. gone. <laughs> but he also was kind enough to, uh, kind enough to leave us a link. Uh, and uh, it's, it's basically a link to a uh, guy named Wade Edward Spear. Yeah, he has who wrote a book about the Brown Mountain Lights phenomenon. And he did a Zoom um, presentation. Uh, he's also a, a geologist and archaeologist. So. And he's a honey, he's a beekeeper. Yeah. He's local. Um, he has a very thorough book that I checked out from the library and read. And from a geological standpoint and from a scientific standpoint, he proves a very scientific perspective or look on the brown mountain lights. He also, he's a skeptic, so you have to take this um, from a scientific perspective. Yes. He he does not um, attribute the brown mountain lights to anything paranormal or paranormal. So, yeah, I, see, I don't I don't really know what his actual opinion is because I didn't I didn't get the book. Yeah, so so he did do a presentation uh, around October thirtieth, and I believe that's still available out there on the internet. So we provided a link in the show notes for you guys to check it out. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I believe that link also shows where you can get his book. So, Very nice. Yeah. So we do appreciate that sincere answer, though, from Bryson. Because yep. So there you go. Uh, in order to win a contest that we have here on the old Creep Geeks podcast, you just have to enter. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so far, but yeah. That was kind of fun, so we kind of put it out there, and hot dog on the stick is the correct answer. We did accept hot dog, and we also did accept the fact that we will drive the we drive our way to the location, only to find out it's gone. Yeah, but Which my is, thing is, this is true. Like, you know that I guess it was that show we watched earlier this year or early fall, and that explorer guy he tried to like find it, and he had to cross yeah. an area where the bridge had washed out and yeah, all this yeah. other stuff, and he bushwhacked his way and it had disappeared. Yeah, yeah. So I. You know, and I, I'm not exactly sure where that guy was, although we've been in the area, and it, it looked an awful lot like an area where he bushwhacked his way to get there, but we could just park in the parking lot and walk over there. Except for the area where the bridge washed away. That's what I'm saying. Though. There's yeah. a parking lot that's like a quarter mile away, oh. but I'm not for sure. So, Yeah. Because sometimes Hollywood does that. Yeah. So let's make this look more exciting than just parking your car and walking over to the spot. <laughs> So now personally, I like the parking the car and walking over to the spot because that makes it easier to do a mass exodus if you need to, or a hasty retreat. Should the Brown Mountain Light want more than just one hot dog on a stick? Hmm. Never know. So anyway, there you go. There is the answer to the podcast question that we asked for our episode number 200. Hot dog on a stick. Yep. Okay. So um, you put a little uh, link in here because December is a month filled with holiday magic and weirdness. That's true. <laughs> So, you, you'd you think after October, you know, which is full of weird and paranormal and stuff, things would die down. There's less weird out there in the world. But it turns out December has a lot of UFO and paranormal events throughout history. And I found this uh, website, and it's ufonut.com. But it turns out it's actually by uh, Chuck Zakowski, who is a UFO paranormal field investigator and has a lot of uh, like 
he's he's legit basically he has all his uh accreditations and all acknowledgements and things yeah, he's like done. right on the side yeah and i'm like wow well he's from the uh series that was on tv the alien highway team i guess or oh. alien highway yeah and fun fact uh i think that show or episodes i, don't, I can't remember if it was a show or a series i think it was a like a short series yeah like mini series um yeah he's got a couple teammates there he's got heather taddy we met her yep so yeah. we know her and um daniel zakowski oh uh, Zukowski. How do you say that? Z- Zuka- Zukowski. Z- Zukowski. Yeah. yeah. So he's done this research. He's found all these other uh, UFO and paranormal events that have happened throughout the month of December. And one of our favorites is December 9th, 1965, the Kecksburg UFO incident occurred. Yes. Um, yeah. And that was uh, Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. A large fireball was seen by thousands in at least six states and Ontario, Canada, it streaked over the Detroit, Michigan, Windsor, Ontario area, reportedly dropped hot metal debris, uh, blah, <laughs> hot metal debris over Michigan and northern Ohio, and started some grass fires and caused sonic booms in western Pennsylvania. It was generally assumed and reported by the press to be a meteor after authorities discounted other proposed explanations such as a plane crash, errant missile test, or re-entering satellite debris. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, we... we they still don't know definitively what, that, definitively what that is. Yeah. You know, there's been, like, it's a theories, everything from it's a crashed, like, Nazi bell. Yeah. It somehow traveled through that way. Um, it's more than likely a piece of spy satellite stuff. And if like you, debris or something, because it came down pretty quick. Yeah. And the military was there for them really quick. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I, I don't know. It's a neat story, though. <clears throat> and there is, um, so there's an expert that we actually have met and talked to a little bit who knows all about it. Remember who, uh, who that is? Yes. Stan Gordon. Very nice. Yeah. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Well, we went to Kecksburg and yes. yeah, we were on our way. Well, we were on our way back from the Western Pennsylvania Conference of the Unexplained and we met Stan Gordon. You talked to him for quite a bit. Yeah. And um, we decided to stop by after the conference and we got to see the model of the crashed object. Well, <clears throat> the funny thing was is that I, was, I talked to Stan as we all were kind of packing up to leave, and I was like, yeah, we were going to go out to Kecksburg, but it's dark. Yeah. And he's like, well, they'll turn the lights on for you. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, they'll turn the lights on for you. There's a monument out there. You can see it. It's lit up at night. It's when you get there, they'll turn the lights on. <clears throat> and I didn't understand quite what he meant. And so we went out there, and this is now a residential kind of a area. Well, it's next to the Kecksburg Fire Station. Yeah. Well, evidently, and if I hope I have an understanding of this, they turn the lights on. They'll look out there and they'll see you parked there and flip the lights on. Yeah. And then you can see the monument and take pictures. And then when you leave, they turn them off. Or it's got some kind of motion sensor thing, but I don't think so. Yeah. And, but I think see, some dude just flipped the lights but, on so we could see it. And see, like, you'll read stuff like that when you go looking for weird places to visit and travel. And, you know, like, next to the fire station or next to a marble company. Yeah. And... Next thing you know, you're like bushwhacking two miles into the woods next to a Winn Dixie in Kentucky, you know? Yeah. But and that's in, not at all the case with this. It's like you pull up the fire stations right there on the right and they'll turn the lights on. Yeah. Now, the model that is well lit when you pull up is um, supposed to be the crash object that the witnesses had seen. And it, the model was created for the show Unsolved Mysteries. It's a space acorn looking thing. Yeah. And it's supposed to have like the genuine pictographs or drawings that were on it, but who knows? Yeah. So it's still pretty neat and it's definitely a cool spot to go check out. So um, that was fun. So we took <laughs> our pictures there and we kind of went off. So I thought it was pretty neat. So yeah. So that's something that happened in December. Is that it? Uh, there's a lot more. Oh, and some of it is stuff that we need to talk about that I'm not too familiar with, like December 26th. 1980, the Rendlesham Forest incident, Ooh, yeah. known as Britain's Roswell. Kind of getting into uh, probably Nick Redfern's area there. I think he lived there or was 
grew up close to that. Yeah. So, and I don't really want to go over that one because I kind of think we should devote a show to that one. Yeah, but well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of theories with that as well, including that it may be a big psyop. Yeah. That is there, so. But from what I understand, yes, it was very much the equivalent of Britain's Roswell, but there's also things like time slips and possible uh, portal activity going on right there. So it was a whole mess of stuff that was experienced by multiple individuals, including, like, military people. Yeah. So that was December 26th at... And you know, I, I didn't even think about that, you know? Yeah, in Rind- Rindlesham, yeah. Rindlesham Forest. Yeah. Now, December 29th, 1980, the Cash Landrum incident happened. Oh, yeah. And that was, I guess, uh, Betty Cash and Vicky and Colby Landrum were driving home to Dayton, Texas after dining out. After 9 p.m., while driving on an isolated two-lane road in the dense woods, They originally observed a light over the trees that came closer, revealing a diamond-shaped object. Cash got out of the car to investigate and noticed the heat was strong enough to make the car's metal body hot to the touch. The object moved higher in the sky, soon to be surrounded by 23 helicopters as it flew out of sight. Later that evening, all the car's occupants suffered symptoms of ionizing radiation contact. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now... One of my favorites is December 26, 1985, the famous Whitley-Stryber abduction incident occurred. And, you know, if you've read the book Communion, you know all about this, but Whitley-Stryber states he was abducted by aliens from his cabin in upstate New York the evening of December 26. Based on his personal experience, he wrote the popular book Communion. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's some cryptid stuff, because all that was UFO stuff. But next up is December 12th, 1964, the Hook Island Sea Monster. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> per- it's like a giant tadpole. It does. So. <clears throat> and this is Robert Lee Serac and his family were crossing Stonehaven Bay, heading to Hook Island, Queensland. They spotted a large tadpole-like monster about 40 feet, or I'm sorry, 30 feet long. The family said the creature had eyes on the top of its head, kind of like a tadpole, pale looking with slit shaped pupils. It was black in color with traverse stripes and the skin appeared to be smooth. They took multiple photos, which today are still being debated. Yes. Yeah. So there's another one in 1987. It's the uh, Ilkley Moor alien incident in Yorkshire, UK. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, you have Philip Spencer, who was a retired policeman. He's walking across the moor with his, fa- uh, basically heading to his father-in-law's house. And uh, he started to take some pictures, right, mm-hmm. of some strange lights he'd seen on the moor. And while he was loading his camera, he saw a strange-looking creature through the fog, and it was a small being, right, on the slopes of the moor. Oh. So he took a photograph of it, and then he ran uh, towards the the being, trying to chase him down. And that's when he saw a flying cl- uh, craft with like a top dome, and it rose across uh, up from the moor grounds, yeah. and then disappeared into the sky. And he wasn't able to get a picture of the craft, but he was able to get a picture of the small being. Yeah. And so you got this picture, and it shows a grainy image of a like a bipedal creature, and it's not really cl- clear enough for definitive proof. Uh, but Philip Spencer relinquished all rights to the photo for analysis, and has never made any money from it. Hmm. So that kind of goes towards, you know, possible credibility. You have people that see something like this and they're not trying to make any, you know, or gain any, you know, notoriety or any kind of gain off of something that just kind of, I think, helps to maybe say, you know, what this person believes they experienced was genuine. And there is a weird looking picture. Yeah. And it is definitely grainy. And it's like, the it looks like it could be a gray and or also, small, you know, like with long arms. Also, it looks like it could be a blue goblin. Yeah. And it's in the moors, which are notorious for things like ghost lights. Interesting. Yeah. So that's cool. Yes. 1999, you had the Lake Murray monster of Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And villagers traveling in a canoe reported seeing a large creature wading in the shallow water near Baboa. Um, the creature was described as having a body as long as a large construction truck. With a long neck and long slender tail, its hind legs were as wide as a coconut palm tree's trunks. 
and had two smaller forelegs. The head resembled the shape of a cow's head with large eyes and sharp teeth as long as fingers. The skin was similar to a crocodile's skin and had large triangular-like scoops on its back. Mm, could be like, sounds kind of like Nessie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so there's a whole bunch of these. They talk about the Bermuda Triangle and a bunch of different aircraft that sort of got missing. Like December 5th was the super famous 1945 Flight 19. Oh, these are all Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, there's a lot of Bermuda Triangle. And that kind of makes sense because the area, um, of course, the Bermuda Bermuda Triangle covers is is pretty vast. But this time of year, there's lots of storms, including like hurricane season and things like that. So can extend from anywhere from what I think it's October through January or even February, the storm activity and the inclement weather out there in that chunk of the water can be pretty pretty rough so we're not going to go through all of them because there's a bunch of them yeah it's like three in a row december 5th 1945 december 28th 1948 december 15th 2008 yep wow so there's there's (laughs) so i thought it was pretty interesting that there was a, a bunch of things that happened in december and i think for us the most popular well, I can't really say most popular, but the one that we probably relate to the most is the Kecksburg. Yeah. And also, then if you start looking, Rendlesham is really big in just the UFO community in general, you know, being like the UK's version of Roswell sort of a thing. Which I so. kind of I, I kind of attribute it more to, I mean, yeah, it's Roswell, but also there's a lot of Skinwalker Ranch type elements to it. Yeah. You know? So, well, there's a bunch of stuff going on. That's kind of why some people think it was more of a psyop. Oh, so but we'll we'll talk about that in great and agonizing detail one day. But anyway, it's just uh, moving back into the news, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about these monoliths. We talked about the monoliths in past two podcast episodes, and we're talking about them again because now there's more. (laughs) So we had one monolith out in Utah, or if you you know pronounce it Utah, right? Mm Hmm. It was there, showed up, and then as quickly as it showed up, it went away. Yeah. And by showed up, I mean showed up in the news where now everybody can kind of sort of has probably heard of it, right? Yeah. And uh, it's gone. And the funny thing is, is that you know people were like, don't know how, why, who took it and all this stuff. Well, evidently some people have came forward and yeah. uh, sort of revealed themselves. And this is according to Coast to Coast, who got the article from somewhere else. It basically talks about these two dudes, uh, well, actually, it's a, a group of dudes um, who got together and removed it. So the question of who removed the mysterious monolith in Utah has been answered as a pair of individuals have stepped forward to take credit for bringing down the odd object. Mm-hmm. So the 10 to the 12 foot tall metallic piece it even became popular in the news. But so what they did was they decided that um, they needed to be gone. Yeah. Because their thinking behind the whole thing was um, they didn't want people to move, get out into the area to go see this thing. And these people that maybe would show up and not be prepared and would probably get in trouble, as in, you know, meet, maybe need to be rescued. So, um, plus, they said that the area um, they thought wasn't ready for all of that impact because you get a bunch of humans cruising out there to go see something that's going to trample the natural splendor that's already there. I mean, yeah. Wasn't it like on the border of NPS and BLM land? Uh, yeah, yeah, something like that. You know. And then you've got the, the two guys are Sylvan Christensen and Andy Lewis. And they said they were responsible for the removal and they took down the piece because they didn't want the swarms of people flocking to the site, which it really wasn't designed to be able to handle all that. Uh, which, you know, I can kind of see that because they don't want to worry about degrading the otherwise natural and pristine landscape. I'm concerned. Most of our national <laughs> parks and wildernesses are closed or they're like reduced staff. I mean, it could have a serious... Well, yeah, that, and you also Impact. get, like, we talked about in the past where, you know, like, the one lady decided to go tag these national monuments with her, like, Instagram tag. Yeah. And then you had this other people, like, knocking off one of the boulders that's sitting on top of this little skinny spire, you know, that you see out there, like, whoa, this big boulder on a skinny spire. And there was, like, a whole group of uh, Boy Scouts, and the, the scout leaders thought it was dangerous, so they toppled it over. Yeah. It's like, man, that thing's been sitting there for probably two, four, two to four million years. And you're like, oh, it's too dangerous. So I'm going to go ahead and knock it over. It's like, come on. Well, remember when somebody vandalized a uh, camel rock in New Mexico? 
And well, I don't know if they vandalized it or if it just fell off. Well, they vandalized it, which weakened it, which caused it to fall off. Well, yeah. You know? So but they vandalized it, and then they put, like, a fence around it. <laughs> and then it just sort of, like, part of it just fell off. And I think that happened with the – there's, like, a monument in, in Wisconsin that looked like an old man. Yeah. And part of it fell off, and now oh. it no longer looks like an old man. I think there's one in New Hampshire. It Maybe was, it's New Hampshire. Yeah, it was like – Old man of the woods or something like that. It was like the old man cliff face of some sort. Yeah, yeah. and it's like – his nose and stuff <laughs> fell off now. It's just this big jutting rock that sort of sticks out there. So, but the, so you know, I get yeah, where they come from. Right? The, uh, the ecological impact, I could understand that. Plus the fact that, I mean, we've been to the Southwest, <clears> and some of our favorite places are towards, you know, those types of areas where, I mean, the happy-go-lucky Instagrammers, you know, they're driving two hours and they probably have like, what, three water bottles and some Yeah, you can get out there jerky. and definitely get in a bad spot and kill you, yourself you to know. death because you're not prepared <laughs> at all. And when we go out to these places, you know, we took our camper van and we had like 20 gallons of water and, yeah, you know, uh, like one time we got stuck out in the desert for, I mean, like legitimately stuck. We, we had like 40 gallons of water and enough food to last for like three weeks. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, but there's other people that go out there and they only bring, like you said, like one or two bottles of water and they they get killed to death yeah. because of exposure because it is a freaking desert. But I, I will say this. So one of our listeners, Alan, uh, he sent me some TikTok videos of some people who watched these two remove the monolith. Yeah. And the way they kind of panned around at the scenery and stuff makes it seem like it was a little more accessible than everybody's. It probably is. I mean, you know? like I said, there's those places where we've been, you just drive right up to it. Yeah. And I think the problem with some of those places are you can drive right up to it and get out there. But if nobody shows up for a week because it's not popular, like that's how we got stuck in the desert. Yeah. Uh, we went during a time where there was nobody there at a time where people would like normally show up on the weekends. Yeah. And so we were there stuck because nobody showed up. Yeah. And then once they did, we got a little help and kind of got our way out of it. But like, you know, like we were prepared. So we, you know, we'd have, we'd have been dead like a month later. But I mean, and by then, it, I mean, it wasn't, we'd walk the five miles to the highway kind of a thing. You know, that whole, actually it was going to, remember I did the math, it was seven miles. <laughs> well, either yeah. way, I mean, it wasn't but, like we were 30 miles in the middle of nowhere and I stuck mean, for sure. But. You did bring up a great point though. And that's the whole, you know, the relative location, you know, it, yes, it could be remote if you're not used to it. Um, the thing that I remember as far as vandalism is concerned, remember the first time we stopped by the Continental Divide Trail and somebody had spray painted Joe was here? Yeah. You know, that's the type of stuff that, you know, I see these guys as position on removing the thing. But if it was just a simple monolith, I mean, I don't have a problem with the monolith. I have the problem with the people looking at it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. But now these are popping up everywhere. Yeah. And that's true because there's been a second monolith that showed up in Romania. Yeah. And that was shortly after the Utah piece was discovered, uh, but it also disappeared. Yeah. Right. And then when I was looking at this sort of thing uh, that we're talking about right now, a boof, another one popped up and this one's in Isle of Wight. Yeah. Um, which I don't really know exactly where Isle of Wight is. I think Isle of Wight is Isle of Wight. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, where is that? Cause see, we have an Isle of Wight, Virginia, but I know this is over in England or UK or something somewhere. Yeah. And so the Isle of Wight um, monolith, I think, is classier because it's it's shinier. <laughs> so It um, makes for a great photo op. Though. Yeah, this guy was walking his dog and he found it. And he's like, oh, look at that. So um, I don't know how long that's going to be there before someone takes that down. Isle of Wight uh, is an island off the south coast of England. There you go. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of neat. And it's like, oh, okay, this guy's walking his dog. He finds a monument or a monolith. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty neat. So what we're actually starting to have is a bunch of sort of copy copycat. And one showed up in Pennsylvania. Yep. One has shown up in West Virginia. Yep. And now one has shown up in Albuquerque. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so the one in New Mexico, what's the deal with that one? So the one in New Mexico actually showed up kind of close to where we we would spend a lot of time. It showed up in front of the Albuquerque, the newspaper building. Really? So okay. right off Montano. 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 Yeah. yeah. I-25. So it's right there where people can go park. 
and go stand around in alien costumes or get selfies with it. It's significantly smaller than the one in Isle of Wight and one of the other ones, but it's still pretty big. And See, now, out of all of them so far, I like the one in, in Isle of Wight. It's mirrored. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, it looks like something that would could possibly be from some sort of mysterious place other than the one in uh, Utah, which was stainless steel and something riveted together. <laughs> you know, because so, the guy that, that took the picture of it, Tom uh, Dunford. Yeah. He was out walking his dog with his fiance yeah. and sister. And see, when I read that first, it says Tom Dunford, 29, was out walking the dog with his fiance and sister. Mm-hmm. And at first I was like, is his fiance his sister? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, okay. So anyway, so they, they found it. It was like 730 in the morning. He saw a mysterious mirrored object ahead of him on the island's uh, Compton Beach. And he told the news we went down the steps uh, to the right about 100 yards from us. They saw this big reflection of the sun. And he knew about all the monolith stories, so he recognized it straight away. Huh. Yeah, it is kind of cool looking. It's, it's mirrored, and it looks kind of more like a a monolith that you would see. Uh, you know, something. It looks more like the one from 2001 Space Odyssey yeah. than the other stainless steel deal and the So my thing is... Short one. That one's not necessarily in a remote area. No, and I neither mean, is the one in Albuquerque. Yeah. Now, the one in West Virginia is actually off of something called the Wolf Creek Trail System in a park in Fayetteville. See, I think that's what's happening. There's going to be a lot of mon- monoliths just sort of popping up because people can stick them up real quick and they want people to go over and take pictures. Which makes me wonder, where is one going to pop up in North Carolina? You know? I don't know. But... The one in Albuquerque is clearly... Probably up to pop up in front of some like restaurant or something yeah. in, in Asheville. It's the one in Albuquerque. Clearly, it's like a joke. You yeah, know? well, it's an attention getter. I mean, it's right there in front of like one of the biggest magazines in the state. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in fact, one of our listeners already sent me a selfie of, of her in front of it. So. See, he's working. <laughs> so, it's probably got like a little, you know, www.whatever. So, you know, that's the thing. On there somewhere. The mayor of Albuquerque posted a picture of it. And if you look down at the bottom, you see two tiny stickers. But nobody has gotten back to me on what those little stickers say. Hmm. One yeah. of them probably says, like, Creep Geeks Podcast. Or <laughs> that would be really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's funny. uh Ran into one of our stickers one time on a gas pump. Really? Yeah. Oh. I didn't stick it there. I didn't. So. So. There you go. Famous. Okay, so speaking of monuments, or I shouldn't say monument, monoliths, right? Yeah. I came across this article and I thought it was actually pretty funny. Kind of like a competing thing. Mm Mm-hmm. And the title goes like this, Mysterious Genitalia Sculpture Swapped in Bavarian Mountains for Bigger. (laughs) And so the story kind of reads, while the chaos is the, is, you know, basically the monolith mysteries in Utah, California, Romania, uh, and now the UK, right? There's a giant wooden phallus uh, in Germany on top of the Grunten Mountains in southern Germany. It's a seven-foot-tall phallus uh, sculpture carved of wood. And, several, and, and basically, this was like several years ago, and it's just recently disappeared. Oh. Yeah. And so nobody has claimed responsibility for the iconic wiener. But they're, you know, hikers, man, they, they climb this 5,702-foot, you know, hill to get up to the top. Oh, to so. To take the, a picture of this big, uh, giant wooden phallus. You have a 5,700-foot elevation gain. Yeah. And then you're rewarded with a nice schlong selfie. Yeah. So and but here's the thing though it has been recently replaced with a much giant one, a much larger one. Oh, and this one has testes. Yeah. So I don't know what was wrong with the previous one, <laughs> but evidently they decided to go bigger. So anyway, uh, we're gonna take a quick break. You listen to the Creepy Podcast. We'll be right back. Okay. Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, listeners of Creep Geeks Podcast. Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheapgeek for your free audiobook. You know what they call that thing, right? What? Wiener schnitzel. 
Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay, so anyway, that's about all I got for that particular part of the podcast. Now, you have something else that's been added to the monolith fiasco. Yeah. and Or experience or whatever you want to call it. And that's the thing. Uh, it, it's been added to this whole monumental thing that is the, the monolith craze. But this article came out two days ago, and it's not really getting the traction that it deserves. And, and I want to talk about that later. But this article from the New York Post has uh, a group of artists, and they're taking credit for the mysterious Utah monolith. Now, allegedly, this group that is known as the most famous artist, they posted a photo of the monolith on their Instagram account, um, saying only monolith as a service dot com. Yeah. Now the photo of the three sided metal monolith included specks of the artwork, noting authentic dimensions and museum quality materials. Addition of the three in one artist proof delivery and installation included blockchain certification of authenticity signed and dated the most famous artists 2020 adding that delivery would take four to six weeks. So basically, it's an ad for the monolith. And when people saw that, they kind of flipped out. They're like, wait, are you guys that put it, are you guys the ones responsible for putting it in Utah? And they, they got like these really cryptic, kind of half-assed, honestly, answers. Like, if you mean by me, do you mean us? Referring to the fact that it was a team that possibly installed it out there. And then later on, they went to claim that another monolith had been posted someplace else in California and another one in Joshua Tree. So overall, this group of, I don't know, stunt artists is what they're calling it in this article, uh, are claiming they've made them and you can get your own and have it installed for $45,000. Yeah. Which seems kind of specific. Yep, I'm not really that interested in spending $45,000 for a stainless steel triangle. Now, is this a, a money grab gimmick, or is this, you know, it was $45,000 cleverly thought out, like in case they got busted putting art on, like, public land? I have all these theories about that, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I should even think through those theories, because is this genuine? Do you think these guys are really up to the the, the ones responsible for this, you know? Hmm. Um, we've, we've seen all these different monoliths. Some are similar, some are not. And they're like, you know, we have Romania, we have California, Joshua tree, um, Utah, all these. And there's one in, in West Virginia on like some state park nature trail. that's really long. Yeah. See, that's the whole thing. I don't necessarily think that they did it. Yeah. I think they're trying to capitalize off of it, and so is everybody else. I don't think this thing is supposed to be some thought-provoking thing like a Georgia Guidestones. It's not a monolith like a 2001 Space Odyssey monolith. It's it's just technically what it is is just graffiti. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, I don't know. I think it's much ado about nothing, honestly. And 2020 being the way it is, this is a little diversion. And I think you're going to see a lot of these things popping up where people, you know, can go take pictures or whatever. And and I don't know. think these guys are really responsible for it, considering when it comes to the Romanian monolith. This article mentions that somebody on Mashable tried to interview the artist collective guy, Matty Moe, yeah. uh, who's been posting about the monolith on Twitter. And he said, I didn't post the Romanian monolith because I only had three spots for photos available on my website. I'm like, okay, that's a little. If if you're charging forty five thousand dollars for a for a monolith, I'm sure you got room to add extra storage. Yeah, you can delete your, a garbage picture <laughs> on your square Squarespace account or something, yeah. you know. Um, but is it is this some sort of performance art? Is there some underground group that we don't know of that's putting these up to? I don't know. Maybe they have some sort of message that they want to get across. Is it just a prank? I, I don't know. And when they all first started happening, uh, there were some famous UFO and paranormal researchers who hopped on the alien bandwagon, and now they're getting flack for it. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, they should. It's obvious. Okay, so when they showed a picture and you could see a rivet yeah. holding it together, you should be out right there. 
That's true. But I mean, I'm it's like, ooh, we're aliens. We're going to set up some kind of symbol to let you know we exist and we're going to use a mechanical fastener. Yeah. Why couldn't they just like bend the one piece of stainless steel? You know? But like, you know, the flack and the fallout includes people like, you know, like Linda Moulton Howe and stuff, which other podcasts are talking about, you know, that she went on to the whole alien thing. And I, I mean, yes, we all in 2020 want something to grab onto. This monolith thing ain't it, nope. though, you know? Yeah, I'm done. We're not going to talk about the monolith stuff anymore, unless <laughs> unless it's cool. I mean, and it's not, you know, and that's the whole but, thing. It's getting more attention than it probably should because somebody found it by accident. So it's almost like if this thing was found, they don't even really know how long it's been there. So the helicopter guys that were flying around, they found it, and it's almost like it got outed before everybody was ready for it to be outed or something. Oh, well, see, remember I said I last podcast episode, you know, I was like, what if this is some sort of like long term performance art prank and we're going to see these in other places like state parks and, you know, like way out there places. And that's what we have started to see so far. But then we're seeing stuff like downtown Albuquerque. Well, yeah. And we've never said aliens. No, because <laughs> it's obviously not. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't think, like I said, I, I don't think it's any more thought provoking or whatever than the Georgia Guidestones. Oh, it's not. It's just a. It's just a monolith. It's there, and it's a little piece of art stuck somewhere. It's supposed to make you think about something. Whereas the Georgia Guidestones have these cryptic, you know, world population numbers and messages all over it and stuff. So that's even even slightly more possibly sinister because it's creepy. Yeah. They stick a stainless steel monolith out in the middle of the desert. Yeah, that's that's kind of weird. It's not creepy, though. Like I was saying before, if it was like black marble or something like that, I'd be like, whoa. Oh, yeah. But that's expensive. <laughs> the I mean, but certainly with $45,000, yeah. I think you could afford it. That's what they're selling, a stainless steel triangle. Which is silly because, I mean, like the Georgia Guidestones, those cost a lot of money, and they are marble, yeah. right? You oh, know, yeah. So I, I going to your idea... I would love to kind of see a black obelisk. And I was, yeah, that'd be crazy. I was talking to one of our listeners on, on Facebook messenger. And I said, you know, it'd be kind of cool to see a monolith in certain locations. And she was actually kind of upset with one of the locations I named because it's, it's kind of sacred, untouched, pristine wilderness. Cause I said, wouldn't be cool just for a photo op to have one like in Bisty Badlands. Yeah. And she no, had no, to no. remind me that sacred land and at that point, you would be doing a detriment to this whole thing, yeah. you know? So. It's a stunt. It's a stunt. And, and we're done. Yeah. We're done with that stunt. <laughs> like, ooh, you know, you know what it is? It's a, it's a TikTok famous thing. It's only there for like a minute or two. And it's like, oh, and then it's going to kind of go away. Is that the way art's going? This is. Yeah. And that's really not our podcast at all. That's an art podcast that should have that discussion. Well, <laughs> I just think they weren't they weren't probably as organized as they as this you know yeah team of stunt artists is. I, who knows? Hmm. I mean, if anything, then what's the what's the what's the point? What's the message? Um, that they're able to create authentic art objects through monoliths as a service. What's the service? I mean, the one in the in Utah pointed north is that the service? I don't know. I think these guys. I now, if these guys are truly responsible, it's a marketing ploy to draw attention to the fact they can make monoliths and install them wherever they want without getting caught. So far, I don't know. Which is not a service I, I'm interested in. Okay, so when when this thing first popped up, yeah, I thought it was kind of neat. I'm like, ooh. Yeah, And then I've seen a picture and seen where it looked like it had been screwed or riveted. And I'm like, okay, well, it's obviously not what everybody thinks it is. It's not nearly as mysterious. Yeah. The thing is, you know, this sort of takes away from other things, like where they found like an eight-mile-long um, sort of cliff wall Yeah, that has all these ancient writings and stories and stuff on it from somebody from way back in the past. You know, it's like all these wall... Like like pre Cambian like, or pre Columbian. Well, they don't. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. they don't and, even know. And yeah. that to me is a little bit more interesting, but it's not nearly as. I, I don't know. It doesn't have the same sort of um, pop culture grip that these 
cheesy stainless steel mon- monuments do. And now there's going to be a bunch of copycats, like the one in Albuquerque and stuff like that, and it's just going to kind of go away. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to make art, it, I kind of, if you're going to make art out in the wild, it should have some sort of permeance. Well, I think know? that's what they were trying. But see, that's the whole thing, though. It's, it doesn't have the same allure as like finding, you know, like a black obelisk kind of a thing. It's just, I don't know. Or it's, stairs to nowhere, even, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's not. I don't know. Anyway, we're done with that. We're we're not going to give it any more <laughs> any more credit. Because at this did. point, you're getting grumpy, and I've noticed some other paranormal researchers out there on social media. They're starting to get a little grumpy about it too. Yeah, because it's it's obviously it's not the work. I, I don't know how. to – Okay, so what, to, to me, it seems like this is a group of people. They're artists or whatever, and they, they you know they're out there and they they put the art out there or what they're calling you know art, and they're trying to have this message or whatever. It's just you know what this is. This is the storm area fifty one thing. Yeah, but trying to create some like weird, spooky, you know, thought provoking thing. You know what I mean? Like it's it's not like they found you know uh, or unearthed out of nowhere like uh, a bunch of Dead Sea Scrolls or some ancient you know wall art. Or wall writings that's eight mile long in the Amazon. It's not like that, but it's kind of like that's what they were going for yeah. in some sort of weird way. And they put it out there, so it does not having the same impact. And to me, it seems like they're maybe a little unorganized. It doesn't have the same message. I mean, they originally thought it was from a movie. Yeah, remember we thought it was from. Yeah, the West and it's World? like oh, it's not. So who knows how long it's been there? It's not the same thing. Yeah, it probably would have had a better impact if it literally was like from a movie, and then people. Also, so it's much ado about nothing, really. Yeah. And then some dudes took it down and took it off, like took off with it. I wonder if it's the same dudes that put it up. And they're just not, you know, they're trying to be elusive and they're not even really answering any real questions about it, the ones that they think may have done this. I'm not saying no. Yeah. But I'm not saying yes either. It's like, okay, whatever. I don't have time for that garbage. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's same thing, like out in space, there's this mini moon thing that we've been looking at. Like, Ooh, what is that? And come to find out it's like a booster rocket from a 1960s Atlas oh. rocket out there whizzing around. There's other stuff to worry about. And so that's uh, the thing. There is other stuff to worry about other than these monoliths. Yeah. I mean, it was show. a nice little diversion for a couple minutes that seemed to blow up and become something. And now it's not what it should be. And plus, once you add money, or what I want it to be, add money and customized art to it. Yeah, it just kind of like you can have your own obelisk for forty five thousand dollars. For forty five thousand dollars, I could have a house. You might as well just play a commercial on late night TV. Call now and get a second monolith yeah. free. It's like let me, you know, let me go to a restaurant supply store and get me a nice little sheet of stainless steel or something like that. Ooh, like a oven vent, yeah. you know, or what do you have, stove vent? I don't know what those are. Yeah, we don't know. We don't yeah. work in the. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that'd be kind of weird if you just out there and you just see like a stainless steel chair bolted to the top of a cliff. You're like, whoa. Well, see, if you have a stainless steel chair bolted to the top, top of a cliff, like on a spire or something like we were talking about, like with Camel Rock or something, but more of yeah. a real spire where you, if you got up there and you sat in that stainless steel chair, you were on top of the world. I mean, that's, that's like more thought provoking for me as far as art goes, because that's a vantage point, right? You're surveying the world in which you live on. So you're, you're taking a seat to nature's splendor. Yeah. See, so that, that would be more thought provoking. An obelisk. Well, remember, I don't know. Remember when we drive through, like, past Cerritos, New Mexico, and there was those weird bronze, like, metal horse sculptures on the edge of cliffs? Yeah. And you could basically stand next to them, and you had a great view. Those were, you yeah. know, thought this, provoking. I, yeah, I don't know. It so. seems like this is the work of. I, I, who knows? I, I don't want to. Well, as they call it, it's the work it's like, of it's, stunt artists. Yeah, stunt artists. It's like fake people trying to be deep. Yeah. Which we may be completely wrong because we're, we're only getting this crap from like... When stunt artists man. go home on Christmas or get introduced to their girlfriend's parents, they're like, uh, he's a stunt artist? Yeah. You know what? i tell you what. Somewhere <laughs> along the way, I guarantee you, a ukulele is involved. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right. So that's enough of that. Yeah. All right. So anyway, moving back into the podcast... A um, couple things are happening. You can get the Mark of the Bell, which is coming out pretty soon. If you're a, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, Kickstarter. Kickstarter person. Uh, those are going to be coming out. And the reason why we like the Mark of the Bell, which, because it was really good. It was a really good docu, what do you call horror. it? Horror. 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 horror doc, docu horror. Yep. About the Bell Witch. Kate the Bell Witch, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought it was really interesting because this is one of those little stories 
that's way much deeper than what you think it is and way more involved. You know, when you read a little blurb about the market, about which like somewhere like Wikipedia, you're like, Oh, that's interesting. But then when you actually see um, the detailed information that went in, into making the actual horror docu docu horror. Yeah. Docu horror. And the people that do the research and you get more details, it just, it, I liked it a lot. I liked the way it was shot. I liked the way it looks. Yeah. I like the way small town monsters does their things because right now, they're like the only ones, aside from like the stuff you see on TV, that's, that's putting a serious sort of like we're going to dig into this and, and try to make something and, and and make something decent. I wanted to talk about that for a moment. We've had a couple of kind of wintry cold days, so we've kind of stayed home and we've been watching some some TV in the paranormal and cryptid spectrum. And I got to say, some of the shows that are out there, it, it's it's like they lack depth. Just like the artist putting these obelisks. <laughs> Shh, up. Don't say that. Watch this artist like get mad at us and install a monolith in the middle of our driveway or something. Yeah. There's going to be like a headless ukulele in the driveway or something. <laughs> but I'm going to wake up to a headless uk- uh, uh, just the head of a ukulele. But I mean, we we've seen some really good ones recently on TV where that like discussions of things that small town monsters has covered, like you know Beast of Bray Road and things like that. But then we've seen some where we're like, this is lacking the substance of why should I care about this? Why is this important in the paranormal community? Yeah, and that's where where people like small town monsters and a few other uh, writers and authors that we respect. They take that extra step to explain, you know, the message and and the importance of this phenomenon. Yeah. So that's why we really think you should guys. Okay, we're going to amend the title of the podcast to include a show that we watched that was good. Yeah. And uh, I mean, because okay, so uh, Mark of the Bell Witch is great. Yeah. And it's a movie that you can rent and you can buy and you can pre-order and all that stuff. Right, and sooner or later, probably be on every viewing platform that you want to view on. The one we seen on TV yesterday that I thought was really good that we both watched was the Survivor Man. Um, I, I didn't even catch the title of it because I was doing something else, and then Les Stroud came on, and it was like Survivor Man Search for Bigfoot. It's Survivor Man Bigfoot, and then yeah, okay, well, there you go. And then each look, it's so Survivor Man Bigfoot colon and then it'll give the location and we yeah. watched one of the more recent ones it was like two hours long which yeah. it, and he went to the uh yinta inta basin basin <laughs> i give up the uinta basin is that it i don't know i call it utah utah the uinta basin so basically he went to really close to um skinwalker ranch yeah. yeah. Well, he he went and to a couple he, different places yeah. too because he was in like Texas where Yeah. Okay, so Les Stroud is one of the outdoor survivor people and he had a show called Survivor Man if you don't know. Now, there was also another guy that had a show about surviving out in the woods and that was Bear Grylls. Mm-hmm. And later on Bear Grylls in the show and the production of the show, it kind of came out that he really wasn't necessarily out there all the time like in the woods trying to survive, like he would be out there doing the survivor stuff and get toted back to the hotel. And, you know, Bear Grylls was the guy that would get, basically, he's trapped outside in the woods and he's got to survive, so he drinks his own urine yeah, and stuff like that and filters water through elephant dung. And then you had a guy like Les Stroud who went out there pretty much by himself with a very minimal support crew, a bunch of cameras that he carried and batteries and things like that, and he was on his own. Yeah. And everything that you've seen... You know, and that show was him recording it. Like he set up the camera, he did it. He was surviving. He was doing his uh, dialogue and talking about things. And it was basically him out there in the woods. So for me, and because with, with those survivor shows that became really popular, he seemed to be the most authentic. Yeah. Because he was doing it all himself. And he even has history where he basically got him and his wife got dropped off and the, Can- uh, the Canadian outback, I guess, uh, where there was like the nearest person was 200 miles away and they, they lived. Yeah. And they thrive, so he's got experience with it. And he's got another show where he, he's out there foraging for food, and he has a chef, and they're preparing all this stuff. So, so when he did a Bigfoot show it, and talked about experiences and trying to find Bigfoot and you know, discussing the phenomena with uh, you know tree breaks and knocks and communication and talking to experts and things like that, it was a lot more authentic. Yeah, he's already built that credibility as being a true outdoorsman, which means you've spent all that time out there. So you should know the difference between – 
a tree break from a squirrel or a wolf or a bear yeah. versus the tree break sound of a large bipedal mammal. He's you know? not like most investigators, like us included, that parks the car and then walks like maybe a mile or two and stays for a couple of nights. Go, Ooh, did you hear that? Yeah. He's, you know, it, it, I but, mean, because he'll be stuck out there for two weeks, you know? Yeah. And, or, or he's definitely out there where if he gets hurt, it, yeah. it could be a pretty bad thing, so. So we watched episode eight, Searching the Southwest, where he went from East Texas to Utah, and then I think he went someplace else, too. Okay. Yeah. It was and like two hours long. It was, well, I think it also, we ended up watching the next episode, too. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but we watched where he was in East Texas, and uh, he went to try to lure him out, and then he decided, you know what, going to Utah, and... It was very familiar because they went to the Uinta Basin. I'm going to try to get that right. And he even set up near an area that reminded me of a place out in New Mexico, um, the Lost Trailheads Trailhead that we went to. Yeah, where it was like kind of cliffy, lots of lots of like canyon type stuff, but also there were small scrub brush trees. And it's funny because he's trying. Well, they also had the wall art where. Yeah. The pictographs and yeah. petroglyphs and stuff like that yeah wall art <laughs> Gosh, <you're> gonna... <laughs> well i mean he... yeah but he he stood out there and he's talking and he's being very analytical and very honest you know about his skepticism but also his acceptance that there's something out there and he he ends up spooking himself because a, a fly is trapped between the 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 rock in the canyon yeah it's making know? a bunch of noise <laughs> Well, see, that's part of it, too. And he also talked about some things that a lot of people don't talk about. Like a lot of the sightings of, of Bigfoot or Sasquatch in that in the southwest area are, could be seen as being a lot more aggressive. Yeah. And things like that. So he obviously has put a lot of thought into it. And it makes sense, him being out on his own in the middle of nowhere, like in the woods kind of a thing. And so he's done the things that somebody who is really interested in it and has researched it. He, he, so he's done the things that you do. If you have a little bit of information and knowledge about the topic. Yeah. He's not like with well, some of the shows that we just talked about where the dude just kind of shows up and says, I'm going to do this research and runs out there and does like, it's like this, this dude is in it. So it's like, he's personally vested. Yeah. And since he comes from an authentic place, and he kind of knows what he's talking about. I mean, you can drop the guy anywhere and he can survive. And he knows like the difference between a chipmunk chattering versus a squirrel chattering versus a fake coyote call. Yeah. That he thinks because he heard it and says, that's not a real coyote. You know, he has an experience. Like he's not out there wearing an Indiana Jones hat and running around trying to be like outdoor survival guy. You know what I mean? And it's so it's, I thought it was a great show. Yeah. And it's funny that we talk about authenticity because Right here, we're, we kind of we started off with small town monsters, which is more cinematic and more developed, and then we're going to this raw Survivor Man Bigfoot. Yeah, but they both but have they the, both it, have that authenticity. Yeah, and that's the point I was trying to make is they have that real depth to them. Yeah, and they have their own unique depth. So it's like so it's, well, on one side you have shows that are there to grab your attention. They're they're there to just be a show. Mm -hmm. And then you have people that are making projects where they have a vested interest in it. Yeah. And they're doing it, you know, as like, I want to be as authentic as possible. I want to tell the story. I want to do it in a way that sort of honors the legend and the people involved and the community involved in the legend. Right. Which is like small town monsters. Mm -hmm. And they want to put out a good quality product and they do. And then you also have survivor man who is, Les Stroud, who's going to be authentic because he is authentic. Yeah. So when he puts it out there and does his investigation, his research and all that stuff, it's more of, I want to know, so I'm going to document it, and it turned into a show. And so you have these shows that are on TV that are super popular, that are kind of flash in the pan, and you're like, oh, that was neat, and that's the end of it. And you have the shows that are kind of in it for the long haul. Yeah. You know, like you have art that showed up in the desert and now is gone. And then you have other art that's been there since the dawn of time kind of a thing, right? <laughs> yeah, and is eight miles long. Yeah, and has you been know? there for a thousand years or more, or a couple thousand, however, however long, since 1200s or whatever, because they want to make sure that whoever sees that in the future, that it's there for them to see. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the thing. So, yeah, because we were earlier thinking about what we were going to talk about with the contest and the Brown Mountain Lights and the investigations and stuff. And some of the things that happened, like Paranormal December and everything we just talked about. But we should have talked about Survivor Man and is in a direct comparison to the flash in the pan thing that is these monoliths. And it is what it is. And that's kind of the way we are with what we're doing today, <laughs> right? Just in general, you have sort of this flash in the pan thing that's occurring and everybody's all freaked out and like, ooh. And then you have the everyday, day to day, you know, life will continue no matter what. You know? Okay. I, I think. Well, go ahead and explain it to me because I've, you know, I've lost I myself. <laughs> well, I mean, flash in the pan, you know, that moment, that glimmering moment of nope, as you like to put it. Yeah, glimmer of nope. But then you have these different facets of what we're living through right now that, you know, whether they're plain and simple and straight to the point, like Survivor Man series. Yeah. Or if they are carefully cinematically you know created like small town monsters or you know earnestly developed like an eight mile mural by early man those things are going to have a lasting effect on us i mean they've set a certain bar you know however modest that bar is or however great that bar is they've set a bar in something uh, for me, for small town monsters, I think they've set a bar with the Bell Witch because that has given me a new perspective on that particular paranormal phenomenon. Uh, Survivor Man, he's set the bar multiple ways. I wish he would do like paranormal conventions, but I know that's probably not his thing. You know? Well, um, okay, I don't, I don't know. I yeah. think he's done one or two. I mean, okay, so <clears throat> we know just by watching that particular show, he's gone and talked to Doctor Jeff Meldrum. Yeah. About casting. He actually had a cast created and foot, uh, we call, uh, feet, yeah. like created in Hollywood to try to duplicate the castings in the tracks that he's seen. He brought those castings made from those tracks and he spent a lot of money. I think he said he spent like $12,000 doing all oh. this stuff. And he brought it to Dr. Jeff Meldrum and his cohort, who I can't remember his name, and had him examine it. And they were polite. Yeah. They didn't outright tell him. These look fake. Okay. They were like, well, you know, we'd like to spend some more time. You know, so they were doing the they were doing the dance of trying to be nice. Yeah. And I think that kind of goes towards the possibility that you may see he might do a convention or two. Oh, well, yeah. But what I, point I'm trying to get to is that with his old show about Survivor and things like that, and in the past he he's never he's been asked about it, but he's never came out and really said anything at all. But in the past three to four years, um, he has gone on to shows and actually talked about some of his crazy experiences that he's had out there and has expressed an interest in it because I think originally he may have been worried about his authenticity when he talks to people and they say, what do you think about Bigfoot? And if he goes, yeah, I had some crazy experiences that they might see him as being inauthentic or not as genuine or it might um, sort of tarnish uh, his legacy or, yeah because yeah. you know if you're a scientist like a, a a for real scientist you can throw your career away by saying that bigfoot is real yeah and you have scientists like meldrum who is a real scientist he's not like i've been a researcher for 30 years kind of a thing he's like no i am a scientist in feet well, i don't know what they call it but you know what i mean yeah so i don't know and sometimes I, I can see where they might be worried about it, but it seems like now he's he's into it. He's doing his own thing, and he wants to investigate. I think it's great. Yeah, but that that whole legacy and lasting impression type thing. The thing I wanted to f finish off with was, you know, we went through all these different things. Uh, the monoliths may not have a lasting impression or impact or legacy or what have you on what we're all going through right now or in yeah, ten no. years. You know, it's a little blip. But then the eight mile mural that probably has like humans with wings drawn on it or alien headed oh, yeah. type I'm, creatures. I'm 90 percent sure there's like a two-hour documentary being made about that right now or a ufo or a bareheaded person something that's going to change history and that's one of the things that lester Al brought up when yeah. he did his southwestern thing he says look there's tall hairy men depicted right next to deer and antelope and other indigenous animals in that area yeah but we're not discounting the legacy that these you know early man murals and drawings have no no 
because at the end of the day, even early man knew there was something weird out there. Yeah. So that's all I got. All right, to we're say. done. I think we <laughs> we have uh, gone yeah. on a little too long, but yeah. Anyway, this particular podcast, we have our podcast winners. Yep. And as we said before, uh, the way to win is just basically participate. Pretty much. <laughs> There's tens of listeners. So, And uh, we would like to say this podcast episode has been brought to you by our Patreon supporters. We have Dave, Isis, James, Bobby, John, and John. And Adam. And Adam, yes. Um, yeah. So and, anyway. Yeah. Thank you guys for your patronage. Now, if you'd like to support the podcast too, that's going to be patreon.com forward slash creep geeks. Be sure to give us a like on Facebook or join our Facebook group. We are trying to make those two entities grow. Um, if you have any questions or comments, it's going to be contact at creepgeeks.com or reach out to us on social media. We're pretty much everywhere. Everything we've talked about is in the show notes for this podcast episode. So as you're listening, if you're going through like Apple Podcasts or Google Play Podcasts, just scroll through and you can click on anything that we've talked about. Yeah. Yep. That's pretty much it. Okie dokie. All right. All right. Well, anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye.